Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're just going to wait a minute or so for everyone to join us. Great to see you here. We'll give it one more minute to allow folks to, to come in and then we'll get started. So thanks for joining us from all around the world. If you guys, while we're waiting for folks to join us, if you don't mind introducing yourself and just adding your name, uh, what institution and what country you're from, that would be great. In previous webinars, we've had somewhere between 55 to 90 countries represented. So really excited to, to see where, where everybody's joining from. Okay, as people are trickling in, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome to our fifth webinar in the um, Hydrogen and Analytical Tools webinar series under the Clean Energy Solutions Center. We're really excited to have you here. Um, in the first uh, four webinars, we've been focusing in on kind of some basic principles of, of hydrogen, major considerations for developing hydrogen markets, technical considerations, and we've been diving into a number of open source analytical tools that are available uh, developed by the national labs. Um, and it's just been a really dynamic and exciting series so far. So really excited that everybody's uh, coming back and continuing to join us throughout this series. So in today's webinar, we're going to be diving into an overview of international hydrogen landscapes um, and really diving into um, topics such as certifications and standards and what it means to participate in international markets. Uh, what are the major considerations for that and opportunities and challenges? So we have a really exciting set of presentations for you today. But before we dive into that, I'm going to pass it over to Sophie Schrader to kick us off with a few housekeeping topics. Thanks, Sophie. Hello, everyone. Um, I will make this really brief because I know you're all excited to learn more about international hydrogen landscapes. So first and foremost, this webinar is being recorded and that recording will be shared with all registrants. Um, we also have all participants automatically muted, um, but we really encourage you to use the chat feature as well as the Q&A function to add any comments, share inputs, and ask questions throughout the entire webinar, and our experts will be answering those questions throughout. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature to contact me, Sophie Schrader, um, and also make sure that your audio settings are adjusted the way you need them to be. Also, we do have captions as an option, so please do consider turning on those captions just to make sure that you're really able to absorb all of the content covered today. We'll also be launching a survey at the end of the event, and we really do look at these surveys to learn from the feedback you provide, so please do consider submitting some feedback. And with that, back to you, Daniela. Thanks, Sophie. So I think we'll go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, first off, we have Dr. Laurent Antony, who's a senior fellow for hydrogen at CEA, which is the French research and technology organization developing uh, alternative technologies and energy since uh, 2003. He's the executive director of the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy, otherwise known as IPHE. Uh, Laurent is the former uh, president of the European Research Association on Hydrogen and Fuel Cells, uh, is a former member of the governing board of the European Clean Energy Joint Undertaking or Clean Hydrogen Partnership, and the former president of the Technical Committee of Fuel Cells at the International Electro Technical Commission or IEC uh, TC105. So obviously Laurent, uh, Dr. Laurent comes with extensive experience in this field and we're really excited to to, to hear from him on the international landscape. Second, we have Catherine Casimar, who works in the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, otherwise known as OSED, where she serves as the Community Benefits Negotiation Leads for over $25 billion of OSED's clean energy demonstration portfolio. 
Catherine has over a decade of experience in the energy sector as an engineer, a scientist, and a policymaker, including three years working to advance justice and equity in U.S. federal policy. She received her PhD in material science from the University of Minnesota and a BSc in mechanical and aerospace engineering from Princeton University. And she's worked in the energy industry as a mechanical engineer. Catherine is passionate about community organizing and building an energy system rooted in equity and justice. Catherine is originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota and currently lives in Washington, DC with her husband, her new baby and two cats. So we'll go on to the next slide just to give you an overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, so first up, as I mentioned, Dr. Laurent Anthony will be giving us an overview of international hydrogen markets and standards. Oh, sorry. And the uh, we'll be discussing specifically uh, the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy, otherwise known as IPHE. Um, then we will have uh, a Q&A, but actually I invite everyone to contribute your questions and your Q&A during the presentation. So if you have any questions, you have a little Q&A uh, Q button at the bottom. We prefer that you use that instead of the chat. Um, and, and we'll aim to address all of your questions during the presentations and not just wait for all of them at the end. Um, and then second, we have a great presentation from Catherine Kasimar, who will be focusing on hydrogen workforce development uh, and energy and environmental justice with a specific focus on the hydrogen market. So again, uh, we have a Q&A reserved for the end, but we prefer to integrate that during the presentation. So any questions that you have, feel free to raise your hand um, or put that in the Q&A button at the bottom. So without further ado, let's go ahead and pass it over to Holly Darrow to kick us off with an overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center. Thanks, Daniela. Hi, everyone. Um, we can go to the next slide. So today's webinar is made available through the Clean Energy Solutions Center, which is an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial focused on accelerating the transition of clean energy markets and technologies led by uh, Australia and the US, the Clean Energy Sol Sol Solutions Center, sorry, supports governments around the world uh, in strengthening clean energy policies and finance measures. And the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL is the operating agent. We can go to the next slide. So the Solutions Center has three flagship services, the training and capacity building, which is what this webinar and over, 100, or over 300 other webinars available on our website are a part of the resource library, which brings together over 1500, 1500 reports, policy briefs, journal articles uh, for, for people to use. And then finally, our Ask an Expert service, which um, provides policymakers in the developing world uh, with technical assistance, expert assistance on clean energy policy and finance solutions for free, so at no cost to those developing country governments. Uh, you can submit your Ask an Expert request through our website, which I'll put the link in the chat. Um, but to date, we've responded to over 300 requests submitted by over 90 governments around the world. Um, and it's a it's service we're very proud of. So that's a quick run through. Um, when with that, I'll hand it back to Daniela and we can get started with the webinar. Thanks, Holly. Um, so yeah, we're gonna kick off our first presentation. Uh, by Dr. Laurent Anthony, again, focused on international landscapes for hydrogen with the focus from his perspective at IPHE. Over to you, Laurent. Thank you very much, Daniela. Maybe I can I would share my screen, yes. Yep. Okay, I think it should work. Looks good. Thank you very much for, uh, for this invitation today and to give me the opportunity to present you, yes, uh, the hydrogen perspectives uh, as a new player of the service on the environment and the economy. And uh, during this, the agenda for today is to give just some uh, elements regarding, uh, we are living in a fast evolving uh, global context. That's in particular the case for hydrogen. And the idea is how can we create a global market and how can international multilateral collaboration be a key player in order to make it happen. Uh, and this is quite important. So if, as mentioned, we are living in a fast evolving global context. So maybe just as a start, just why are we developing hydrogen? Or I would say uh, in particular, but uh, how, why are you fighting the climate change in general? The first, of course, climate change. This is something everyone knows uh, in order to avoid greenhouse gas emissions, to find some alternatives to fuels and energies. 
But the second point, less mentioned, is also about health. The idea is also how, how can we improve the air quality in particular, and this means by developing zero emission mobility or zero emission energy. And another point also for all the citizens is to be sure that you can afford clean energy. And uh, this means we also need to have this energy availability, which means to be able to produce massive clean energy and also to ensure energy sovereignty. And this is particularly, I would say, important to these days uh, in Europe. But finally, in order to, if we have all these three objectives, uh, I would say achieved, the other one is about jobs. If you want to enjoy, usually you also need to have jobs. And this means also technology leadership is also one of the key points we also have to take into account when developing all these technologies to fight the climate change. And here you see that finally for these four pillars, hydrogen has its role and can even play a quite important role uh, today. And also, just for introduction, uh, we all agree that, yes, since Kyoto, we've, we've made quite a lot of uh, improvements, but it is not enough. If you look the the figure on your right, CO2 emissions are still growing and growing. You can see that the COVID uh, impact, yes, had some impact too, but just because of uh, loss of activity, but now we are starting again to emit more and more CO2 emissions. And if you regard, if we really want to be on, uh, on time regarding the Paris Agreement objective, you see that finally to achieve this 1.5 scenario, Regarding the current CO2 emissions, we only have six years left, which is far from uh, 2000, uh, 2,100. And even at the two degree scenario, uh, we only have 25, 25 years left at the current rate, so which just means that we really have to, to now to speed up and uh, now to act more than to, uh, to talk. And this is also something we try to do uh, uh, in the hydrogen community in order to make it really happen. And so if, you re if we look at the different uh, scenarios, what we can see is that in any case, uh, there will be a strong increase in electricity demand. So electricity and uh, low emission electricity is really key in order to achieve this, uh, in particular, net zero emission scenario or Paris Agreement more in general. So and depending on the scenario, it can be a twofold or threefold increase in electricity demand. And what about hydrogen? Hydrogen, you can see depending on the different studies, but I think uh, now a more or less agreed value by 2050 could represent about uh, 15, uh, between yes, 12 and 15 percent of the primary energy used. And uh, what does it mean regarding electricity, in particular, if you want to produce this renewal and uh, low emission uh, electrolytic hydrogen? Here you see that by 2050, we would need at least uh, almost the same amount of electricity globally we are producing today. Around, as you can see, 20, 000, uh, 20, 20, more than 20,000 terawatt hours a year. So just all the electricity we are producing today might be needed to produce the hydrogen we will consume by 2050. So that, here you see that really importance of so, to be able to have availability of uh, low emission electricity. And why is hydrogen so interesting? Uh, finally, because you can produce hydrogen by many different ways, and you can also use it uh, for many applications. So this means that more or less everyone can either produce and or use hydrogen for its own purpose. And uh, this, this explains why now so many countries are interested uh, in uh, developing uh, hydrogen. Uh, everyone can do it. And from different, as you can see, from different uh, primary energies, it can be either fossil fuel, but then you have to, of course, uh, do some uh, carbon capture sequestration, or you can use some low emission electricity uh, systems, either renewable or nuclear, to also to produce that hydrogen. And also one advantage of hydrogen, it's quite easy to transport. So, uh, and uh, depending on the studies, also it can be demonstrated, it's also cheaper to transport over long distances hydrogen more than electricity. Normally you have far less losses, but both of them are complementary. And as mentioned, many, many different, many applications can use hydrogen or even are using hydrogen because you may know that currently we are producing around 100 million tons of hydrogen every year. But the main uh, usage today is for industry in particular for refineries uh, to produce our fuel or gasoline uh, and also for fertilizers in order to produce ammonia and then fertilizers. 
But mobility, as it is mentioned, transport mobility today is also very weak, but this will also increase. So you see many ways to produce hydrogen, but also many ways to use and to consume that hydrogen. And of course, also regarding the cost. Uh, and here you see the, also the, I would say, um, forecasts of the evolution of the hydrogen price. And of course, we want to promote renewable hydrogen or low emission hydrogen more in general. And uh, this is today more expensive than fossil hydrogen. But uh, fossil hydrogen is no more, I would say, on the table. What we have to do is low carbon or low emission hydrogen and using the IEA wording. And low emission hydrogen means that you have to, increase, to, to add to the production cost of fossil hydrogen, the CCS cost. And here you see uh, the differences between this renewable hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen uh, over the years and the, and the different uh, uh, provisions. Uh, and what we can see is that in any case, uh, we now we also need to recognize that at least over the last, for the next decade or decades even, or the, for the next decade, uh, also owing to, or say not owing, but um, because of the inflation, that we have, uh, that we have, uh, the levelized cost of hydrogen has increased over the last years, and even over the last year. And this means that hydrogen produced from fossil fuel with CCS uh, will also have to be taken into account in complementary way with uh, hydrogen produced from renewable electricity or from nuclear electricity, uh, if we want to really be competitive and to develop a hydrogen economy. And of course, we will all we will do our best to uh, promote this low emission hydrogen as fast and uh, as possible and at the, with the lowest price. But currently this low emission hydrogen also coming from fossil fuel can be seen as a, in the transition phase uh, until we have this low cost electricity and capacity to produce this low emission hydrogen mainly from, electron, from electrolysis. So here also there is no, I would say no, there has been no competition but we need to be pragmatic and to make it happen. To make it happen, we need to use any solutions which is available today. Laurent, we do have yes. a, a question in the Q&A uh, from Ravi. He says, I gather Australia canceled a seven gigawatt equivalent hydrogen production due to lack of cheap, good quality water. How can the world deal with such situations, particularly when hydrogen is needed in fossil intensive countries in Asia, as an example? So regarding water consumption, I have some slides uh, just uh, coming. So I would say, uh, uh, I can't, yes, okay. But uh, but if you, if you don't mind, I would prefer to give the presentation mm -hmm. globally and then to take the questions okay. uh, at the Sounds end. Sounds good. So okay. I think it might be uh, easy also for everyone to follow. Great. Uh, if you don't mind. So now, as mentioned, we agree hydrogen is a solution, but it's a complementary solution to other existing solution. And that's why usually we say that hydrogen uh, is the second leg of the energy transition with electrons. So there is also a real complementarity between electrons and hydrogen and not a competition as some try to, uh, to promote. And then the idea is how can you create a global hydrogen market? And I think this will really depend on unique national circumstances, which means that of course, depending on the, I would say the weight, and the focus you want to have regarding these environmental benefits, climate change or air quality, noise pollution, you will. Uh, this is also based on your own political national strategy. Second point is also energy security. Depending on your energy resources, if you have more sun, more wind, or more hydro or, or not available, for sure it will not be the same regarding uh, hydrogen production and usage. And the same for water consumption. If we do not have water, then for sure, you may not be able to produce hydrogen. But here, just regarding this water consumption, here you see this, uh, these, these numbers regarding how much hydrogen, uh, water we need uh, in order to produce hydrogen. And it's around uh, 10 kilograms of water, of yes, 10 liters of water per kilogram of hydrogen. Then, of course, you are processing around the double, but you're only consuming about 10. Uh, but if you compare, by 2050, forecasts around uh, four to 600 million tons of hydrogen, compared with what we are consuming today, you see regarding agriculture, it's only about 1% of the water consumed today for agriculture may be used to produce the total amount of hydrogen uh, by 2050. And regarding uh, one solution is also to produce desanalyzed water. And here you see that 
even for six years ago, this desalinization production by 2018 was more than what we foresee uh, to consume by 2050 to produce hydrogen. So which means that, yes, locally you may have some water stress, but globally, I think water is not the main issue to produce low emission hydrogen. And another aspect, also depending if you are supporting hydrogen more or less, is also depending on the materials you, you, you have in your country uh, or you can purchase. And here you see that here are the critical raw materials. And you may see that, yes, many uh, materials are located in some specific countries. So this may also then uh, create some geopolitical aspects to see if we want to push and to promote hydrogen or not. And then the third point is regarding also the resiliency and the stability of your grid and your, or your grids, I would say, not the grid. Of course, the electrical grid, if you want to produce hydrogen by electrolysis, but also your gas grid. And depending on, on this resiliency and stability of the grids, it might be easier for you to produce hydrogen, to store it or to uh, distribute it into your country or to import it or export it. So grid stability and resiliency, gas and electricity is a critical parameter too. And finally, uh, a fourth uh, key driver is uh, regarding economic growth. And this means regarding innovation and technology leadership. Uh, if some countries are quite strong in developing new technologies and particular technologies used for hydrogen, then of course they will promote hydrogen. But if you do not have this uh, strengths of the industry or your capacity of innovation uh, and if you do not also rely on really high skilled people high, with high skilled jobs uh, then it might be much more difficult to support the creation of hydrogen economy in your own country and so you see that more or less all the countries have the same key drivers but the weight they are putting on these different key drivers really depend on unique national circumstances and that explains why there are different strategies different opinions different visions in developing uh, hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives so what are the key challenges to get to a global at global scale uh, first innovation as mentioned by the uh, figure before we need really to produce low cost competitive hydrogen and this go through also uh, innovation and scaling up of production so both and we need also, as mentioned, to rely on uh, skilled jobs and skilled people and to attract young talents. This is also one key, one challenge we have to face, as uh, I would say everyone wants to speak on, to work on uh, clean energies, but why on hydrogen more than on PV, on wind, on geothermal, or on batteries? So we also have to attract young talents in order to have really also uh, nice people working in the hydrogen field. Second, infrastructure investment. If we want to produce, we need to have some uh, plans to produce massive, uh, massively equipments to, pro to produce uh, hydrogen, but also to have efficient transportation and distribution uh, means. And just an example today, uh, these uh, numbers from the Hydrogen Council, uh, there are a lot of projects uh, starting uh, around the world uh, as you can see here, more than uh, now uh, 1,500 uh, uh, projects uh, with quite a lot of uh, big budgets and billions. But the issue, main problem we have today is to pass from projects to uh, FIDs, to so final, invest, final investment decisions. And here you see today it's between 5 and 10% only of these projects have passed this FID. And this is one uh, really uh, uh, key element also. How can we now speed up uh, this uh, pass, uh, this movement from project to FIDs. And here's just have an example. Uh, as mentioned today, we are producing 100 million tons of hydrogen. But if we look at the different uh, uh, elements provided by uh, different announced projects, by 2030, you see, uh, so far, there is only a capacity of uh, 38 million tons of low emission hydrogen to be produced. And uh, only a small part of it has passed this FID stage. So this is really, that's why I was really insisting on that. Now we need to, to move from projects to FIDs uh, and then to really produce, start producing either uh, plans and also uh, production capacities and usages. 
And finally, a third challenge uh, is to also put in place policy and regulatory frameworks. And uh, this is also important if you want to create trust, to attract investors, producers, consumers, we really need to put in place stable and strong policy signals. And also to ensure that there is a certainty in the regulation put in place that it will not change in the next two years or five years. Uh, you need to have a medium long-term vision and also to ensure market transparency. And I will focus a little more on that specific point. As mentioned, different unique uh, circumstances, but today, as you can see here, almost 80 countries over the world have either already published their national hydrogen strategy or roadmap or are developing these, uh, these roadmaps and strategies. And here you see the different uh, uh, countries all over the world from the five continents. And as mentioned, regarding the different key drivers, this explains why there are many strategies, but the strategies are not always the same. So some countries are developing only renewable hydrogen. Other countries are supporting mainly also uh, hydrogen produced from fossil fuels with CCS. Uh, others also supporting hydrogen produced using nuclear electricity. But what, as mentioned at the beginning, we need to keep in mind is at the current stage, we these different strategies or ways to produce hydrogen shall not be seen as competing, but really complementing each other, at least for the next decades. As we re, What we really need is to have uh, low emission hydrogen available at a competitive cost. And uh, also what we see today is that, as mentioned, some countries are, will be more hydrogen exporter. Some countries will not be able to produce the hydrogen they will have to consume, so they will be seen as importer and some other countries may be seen as just hubs uh, because they have uh, some access to sea and it might be easier than to transport hydrogen from exporting countries to importing countries by ship and so uh, they will just i would say be here as a hub and redistribute this imported hydrogen to the other countries which will consume it and this is for instance the case in europe where you can see that some countries like belgium or the netherlands uh, will uh, have big ports uh, able to receive uh, huge quantities of uh, hydrogen produced by exporting countries like you can see South America uh, or uh, North Africa or Middle East or Australia. And uh, after this hydrogen can be then distributed all over Europe using pipes, for instance. And you have some big importer countries, which might be uh, the biggest one maybe would be Europe and also uh, uh, Japan and, and Korea. So you see, you have at the same time exporters, importers, uh, and this means that one country cannot develop hydrogen alone. We really need to have this global picture. And this means, this is exactly why we really need to have a coordinated uh, vision between the different countries and that only international collaboration can make it a success. So when you see that we need to work at the international levels, so what is the role of international multilateral collaborations? Here you see some initiatives or some organizations developing hydrogen. And uh, they are, it's not uh, exhaustive, but uh, you have, I would say, the main players today. And uh, uh, here we can uh, just speak about also the BRICS, the BRICS agenda, which has been initiated during COP26 by the UK and the US in order exactly to align, to try to coordinate different initiatives in five different sectors. And hydrogen was one of these five sectors. And uh, last COP28, two additional sectors have been added. Uh, and the idea is, as everyone now is working or more or less on hydrogen, not to, or to avoid too much duplication and to try to align and to ensure that all the different initiatives are working together also in collaboration with governments from countries. And uh, for hydrogen, uh, it has been agreed that IPHE will take the role of facilitator, will hold the facilitator, which will try to make all the different organizations work together and to uh, exchange with the different countries. And 
just some words about IPHE. For those who do not know IPHE, IPHE is a global government to government partnership to accelerate the hydrogen economy. And uh, here you see we are about 23 countries and the European Commission. Our current chair is from South Africa with the US, Japan, and the Netherlands as vice chairs. And the idea is really at governmental level to exchange, to share strategies, demonstration, policies, and also to monitor what's going on in the different countries. And from these outcomes, exchanges, to see on, on which topic we should work together in order to facilitate, to speed up the development of hydrogen economy. And then, of course, after to enable this international collaboration between the different entities, which can be either from governments or from different uh, public or private initiatives. And here you see the different uh, priorities which, has be, which have been agreed for the BRICS agenda. The first one on standards and certification. I will provide some uh, focus on this specific uh, topic as IPHG is co-leading that with this IEA H2TCP. Second one, to create demand. And here this is uh, coordinated by the same uh, H2I uh, Secretariat and RMI. Also to look about innovation and research uh, for clean hydrogen. This is uh, coordinated by the Clean Hydrogen Mission. And finally is also to get finance. How can we facilitate uh, finance in particularly for developing countries. And this is coordinated by the World Bank with UNIDO. And you see, we agree on these four different main priorities uh, to make the hydrogen economy a reality. And the idea is really to work together to agree on deliverables, to agree on actions, and uh, to make, and also to exchange with different countries at main meetings, like uh, to have some touch point, annual touch point at the different COP meetings. And so the question is regarding this policy and regulatory framework, what does clean hydrogen mean? Or low emission hydrogen, if we use IEA wordings. Uh, and the idea is really, how can we create trust that it is clean hydrogen I am either producing, buying, or using? And from that point of view, I would say hydrogen needs rules, not colors. <laughs> so this is our, our opinion. And why we do not need colors, because Hydrogen doesn't care about colors, uh, labels. I think the molecule has the same physical properties, physical chemical properties, wherever it comes from. And uh, safety standards or regulations are also technology uh, agnostic. And the key word is really decarbonization. So that's why uh, it's better to labelize, to quantify hydrogen from its carbon footprint point of view more than colors. And another point is if we want to create trust, uh, we need to develop certificates. And these certifications uh, schemes have to be developed in order really to ensure that the hydrogen you are buying in one country has, I would say, the right uh, attributes that uh, which are needed in your importing countries. And today you see different countries have developed their own certification scheme or schemes because some are different. Uh, and the risk is incompatibility of the certification design and also lack of fungibility of certificates and which will just create an, an additional barrier to cross-border trade. So that's why it's quite important now also to, to work together at international level on developing mutual recognition of certification schemes. And how can we do that? Uh, this is exactly how, uh, the idea how to unlock this global hydrogen trade. And first approach is to ensure that we are speaking all the same language because uh, everyone is using the same word. But what we mean behind the word we are using depends on who is pronouncing that word or who is listening to that word. So that's why it's very important first to agree on a common language. And that's why we developed under the Brexit agenda with uh, IPHE, HUTCP, ARENA, uh, a 101 certification paper and this paper is available online and we will update it this year to add some additional definitions. And second is to develop some standardized common methodologies to quantify, to, for, to, for labeling these different ways uh, to produce or different kinds of hydrogen. And uh, this has been done uh, using uh, an ISO standard now, which proposes a methodology for greenhouse gas emissions assessment of hydrogen from well to consumption gate. And if we go more in details, just, I think we do not have to mix, and this is also important in terminology, we do not have to mix the difference between standards and regulation. 
This is just an example for a speed ticket. Who is defining the speed about which you will receive a speed ticket? That's a regulation, that's a law. But how will you measure the speed? This is described into a standard. And the policeman is checking the compliance between, I would say, the value measured, that the value measured is the right one, and compare with the regulation. So you see, usually people are using the word standards, sometimes meaning regulation. So that's why we have to be very careful. A standard is not a regulation, or at least a technical standard is not a regulation. As in English, sometimes standards also means regulation, like, for instance, the UK standards for, for uh, low emission hydrogen. But that's why we need really to be precise when using different uh, words and thresholds, labels or colors. This is defined by public policies or by the market, but not by a standard. So this means that once we have these common methodologies and common standards, harmonizing labels, harmonizing thresholds can only be done through negotiations between governments. So how can we achieve that? And here you see the idea is also to develop a hydrogen passport, as it has been done also for batteries, where you can put all the different attributes of your hydrogen. And uh, some of them will, of course, deal with the carbon footprint, but not only. Then we also have some un environmental uh, aspects or even so social aspects, which will be described more precisely in the next speech. So it's not only on carbon footprint, but you have some other attributes. But if we focus on carbon footprint, this is why we developed uh, this uh, specific ISO standard. And this standard finally just demonstrate that we do not have to consider only a technology or the primary energy. Because here you see, if you consider different energies, uh, it can be coal, gas, or using electricity, uh, and different uh, primary energies, if it is renewable or not, in particular for electrolysis, here you can see that finally, depending, you can use the same technology, like electrolysis, but depending, depending on the way you produced the electricity you are using the electrolyzer, the carbon footprint can be totally different. So that's why when we, this greenhouse gas emission uh, on, regarding on hydrogen really depends on the primary energy used and the production pathways. And that's why we, we say that colors are not the most relevant point, but really to use this greenhouse gas emission or the carbon footprint as really the main uh, factor, the key word, I would say, to, to labelize and to, quanti to qualify hydrogen. And this is exactly why PHE developed a, a methodology, a guideline, some years ago. And, uh, but IPHE is not a standardization development organization. That's why we handed it over to ISO. And this uh, standard has now been published at last COP28. And now we are working on a specific, uh, to move from a technical specification to an international standard. And uh, what is in this document is really a, a well to consumption gate approach. Uh, where you go from well to production gate, then you have to, you can use different hydrogen carriers, which may be either cryogenic hydrogen or ammonia, LOHC, up to consumption point. And then here you will be able to quantify your CO2 equivalent emissions for one kilogram of hydrogen delivered. And finally, once we have these technical, I would say, recommendations, now we also have to work among different governments in order to ensure that every government is also understanding each other to ensure that when we develop some certificates, uh, we can trust each other. And uh, here, I would say this action has been also proposed at the previous COP28, and uh, it has been asked to IPHE and IAH2TCP uh, to give an annual stock take and monitoring of progress at the different COP meetings. And what did we do? This is something we did also the last COP28 meeting. There have been a signature of a declaration of intent of all, almost uh, 40 countries around the world, uh, agreeing that we all need to work together towards mutual recognition of certification schemes. That doesn't mean that we will only have one unique certification scheme, but that because there will be different, but we need to find what are the common criteria uh, and uh, on these different certification schemes and to also see how do we do you do you quantify and uh, qualify that these criteria have been achieved this also has to be agreed on a common approach and this then should really facilitate and speed up uh, international trade and 
not to be too long, so maybe as a conclusion, uh, everyone is or will be, I would say, uh, influenced by the climate change. So that's why I think regarding hydrogen, it is also now well, well adm uh, admitted uh, globally that without hydrogen, we won't be able to achieve COP21 targets. That doesn't mean that hydrogen is not the silver bullet, but is part of the solution that we need to take if we want to achieve COP21 targets. And why hydrogen is really applicable everywhere. And that's why everywhere over the world, we agree to produce, or at least we consider hydrogen in uh, energy uh, policy, because everyone can either produce and or use hydrogen to decarbon in general. That's why tens of countries have published their ambitious hydrogen strategies or roadmaps. But now we need to really to move from project announcement to FIDs. Uh, and this has to really to be increased and, and speed up. And finally, I would say this business as usual is not uh, is no more enough. So that's why we really also need, it's crucial for governments uh, to work with industry, with investors to really facilitate efficient and effective international hydrogen markets. And to do so, international collaboration, international coordination and innovation are key to make our planet grid again. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks so much, Laurent. Really incredible presentation. Lots of great information there. I'm sure there's even more questions, um, but there are, are at least a few to kick us off in the Q&A. Um, I don't know if you wanted to read through them or if we'll just go through them one, one by one. Yes, we can go one by one. So okay. So the first question we did mention earlier, I gather Australia canceled a seven gigawatt equivalent hydrogen production due to lack of cheap, good quality water. How can the world deal with such a situation, particularly when hydrogen is needed in fossil intensive countries such as Asia or in Asia? I think what one today what we see regarding water is uh, also desalinization. And I was mentioning that at the beginning. Currently, globally, we are this and is any more water than we may need in by 2050, but that's globally. Of course, locally, uh, and in particular, the question is also for Middle East countries, they do not have enough water to produce hydrogen, but they are investing uh, in the desalinization of seawater, but not for hydrogen, but mainly for, for the population. And they will use a small part of it to produce hydrogen. And that's the same also in Africa. Uh, also, well, you also need some drink water for the population. So that's why we may have to invest into desalinization. And then the idea is how to ensure to make it cheap enough to be affordable for these countries. So I think it mm -hmm. might be the same for Australia. And if you look today for hydrogen, uh, for my knowledge, most of the demonstrations are nearby the coast. Yeah. Where they can then also use renewable energy, either wind and or solar, uh, to make this one the clock uh, renewable energy production and then able to produce hydrogen. So that leads us perfectly into the next question. <laughs> In the Middle East, hydrogen is produced from desalin desalinized water um, for hydrogen electrolysis. Is this not a double whammy on energy use unless uh, both desalinization and electrolysis is done using renewable energy? What are your comments on that? Here, in fact, we need to look at the full picture. Uh, what is the energy used to desalinize water regarding the total energy consumption to produce hydrogen? And you will see that it's not a lot. Uh, so it's less than 10%. So, uh, so that's why, yes. And that's why in, the, in this methodology, when we quantify the greenhouse gas emissions, we need to take these kind of desalinization and any, uh, I would say, greenhouse gas emissions related to desalinization into account into, I would say, into the uh, greenhouse gas emission quantity for the hydrogen delivered. So it has, has to be taken into account. But... I do not have exact numbers, but I think it's, yes, it's less than 10%, which may be you, uh, consumed to desalinize water. But as mentioned, depending on, for many countries, the main purpose of desalinization plants will not be to produce hydrogen, but mm -hmm. to pr produce drink water for, this, for, this, for the people. Right. And that comes into some of the social considerations that we'll be speaking on a, a bit later in today's webinar as well. Um, next question, what are your views on ammonia as a hydrogen carrier versus just a hydrogen as a gas for gas liquid production? Uh, I think hydrogen, uh, ammonia. Uh, currently, yes, it's very trendy to produce ammonia. Uh, because why? 
uh, from my point of view, uh, because it's maybe the most, it's, it's, it's the easiest way currently to uh, transport massively on long distances hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we import ammonia and to use ammonia as a molecule, as mentioned, main to produce fertilizers, this makes sense. But uh, to crack again ammonia back to hydrogen, to be used at hydrogen, here I think I have much more doubts. <laughs> it is is uh, the best solution uh, regarding energy efficiency, cost um, versus other solutions. But from a short-term vision, yes, it is the cheapest and available. But if you know the ammonia market, if I'm not wrong, it's about 200 million tons of hydrogen every year, but only 20 million are transported. And if you compare the quantity of ammonia we may have to transport, if mm -hmm. we go to this from 100 to two, three, or 400 million tons of hydrogen, you will multiply by 20, around by 20, the number of ships transporting ammonia. And then in addition to cost uh, efficiency, you also have all the safety issues, environmental impacts that you also have to consider. That doesn't mean that it's not impossible, but this will also need to be have a, really a careful check, to be very cautious. Mm -hmm. If you have anything of a, of a boat having ammonia, uh, it can be really dramatic for the environment. So that doesn't mean it will happen, but if you multiply by 20 the number of ships, you multiply also a lot the risk mm -hmm. uh, it may happen. So that's yeah. why then we also have to consider all these safety issues to ensure that there will be no, 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 no effect. And then, so this is for me, I would say the, the answer. And then also regarding uh, ammonia, uh, producing ammonia from renewable hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, means usually that you have to build new plants yeah. because you have, if you are using currently existing plants using fissure troughs. Uh, usually it is coupled with SMR mm -hmm. and uh, the fissure trough is using the heat of your SMR, which means that you may only use 15% of hydrogen as for coming from renewable hydrogen and the rest mm -hmm. has to be produced by the SMR. Or except if you find some other heat source and that's why usually people are ha have to build new plants. Mm -hmm. So this is also something regarding timeline. You also have to consider or investment uh, in some countries producing currently ammonia, uh, what they can do in order to remain competitive or not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that's part of uh, the discussion on why a lot of applications for ammonia are often domestic and looking kind of for local consumption to start with as well, um, considering all of those complications. Okay. And then we have one other question. Is there any effort to look into electrolysis of seawater directly to produce hydrogen? Would this be the cheapest option? Uh, I know there are some studies uh, using uh, directly seawater to electrolyze seawater. Uh, there are some announcements, but this has to be, I would say, proved because at least uh, regarding what I read uh, in mm -hmm. different papers, it is more or less, yes, they are using directly seawater in the box, but inside the box, more or less, they are doing a desanalization before really entering the electrolyzer reactor. So uh, yes, it is a topic, but regarding corrosion issues, regarding impurities you have in the in, in your water, uh, if you want to have really uh, long-lasting electrolyzers with high efficiency, I think mm -hmm. this still needs quite a lot of research. Right. Okay. Any other questions? And if there are, uh, feel free to raise your hand as well. Those were really great questions. Okay. If no other questions, feel free to put them um, in the Q&A or put them in the chat. And obviously we can address them later. Uh, Laurent, if, if you're able to stay, that would be great. Um, I'm sure there's there's plenty more questions that may arise uh, as we progress with the webinar. Thank you so much, Laurent. Really, really great presentation. Very informative. Um, so kind of moving forward, and, and as Laurent alluded to, there's a lot of considerations that we need to look at when considering international market opportunities. And so we tried to capture all of this in, in a sort of flow diagram or a flow chart to really you know, process what this might look like in terms of 
you know, going through the process of considerations, you know, starting off with kind of very typical questions. Is there market demand for the product, for the hydrogen product or derivative that we're looking at? Do we have alternatives such as electrification? And then looking at all of the social and environmental considerations. And all of this is really key when trying to come to a conclusion of whether or not it makes sense to move forward with a hydrogen or hydrogen derivative project. So I know this flowchart is, is kind of crazy and a bit overwhelming um, and obviously shouldn't be used for any uh, specific investment decisions, but more to illustrate uh, the kind of decision-making process that one could go through when evaluating whether or not to participate in international markets or international hydrogen markets. So let's go ahead, go to the next slide. We've tried to extract a couple examples from this flow diagram, and here's one where uh, a hydrogen project might look quite favorable. For example, we start off with the, with the classic question, is there a market demand for hydrogen or this hydrogen derivative? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's look at the alternatives. Is electrification feasible and might it be cheaper, for example, um, with, with vehicles? You know, it, does it make more sense to focus on electric vehicles rather than hydrogen fuel cell vehicles? Um, if no, then let's keep asking more questions. Are clean energy sources or carbon capture and storage available in the area of interest? Um, and if so, you know, is that really promising in terms of developing low carbon or low emission hydrogen? If they are available, then we start asking more questions. Is the production cost less than the current market cost or the willingness to pay for that particular product? If the production cost is lower, then we have a very promising economic viability of this project. So then we might start asking, well, in terms of all of the options that we have for decarbonizing, are there other cheaper decarbonization activities that we might want to focus on that are more low-hanging this particular project uh, utilizing hydrogen or generating hydrogen or its derivatives. Um, and if there aren't any cheaper options, then we, we keep going. Um, then we start asking, okay, are there any environmental or social barriers that might prevent this project from de being developed. And this is really, really important because we know from around the world, from renewable energy and other energy projects, that not having the social buy-in or having a major environmental red flag could, be, could completely halt the development and progress of a project. So this is a really key question and one that we could even ask earlier on in this process. This is by no means um, prescriptive as to the specific order of, of how we want to ask these questions. But it's an example of a barrier we could get to. Um, even after getting through all of those other parts of this process. And if we don't have any environmental or social barriers, that's great. Then we can keep moving with our project and start looking at, do we have local demand for this product? You know, can we use uh, a domestic market or maybe even a hub to develop this, this product and, and, and have local demands so that we can reduce the requirements for transport infrastructure, distribution infrastructure, even shipping it to, to other countries. Um, so that's a serious benefit from an economic perspective if we have those local off takers. And then we can start looking at, well, if we don't have local off takers, do we have international off takers? And that's where we're really getting into this discussion on international markets. Who are those off takers? How far away are they? What are they willing to pay? And when we look at all of the added costs of storage and transport and delivery, uh, all of the infrastructure that's required for that, is our cost still competitive and still below that willingness to pay? And if so, we look at this, this last set of questions. Do we have the regulatory framework, the standards, the certifications that Laurent was mentioning? If those aren't in place, then we don't have a structure to enable that export, ensuring that our hydrogen is low low carbon or low emission or our hydrogen products um, or derivatives. So really, you know, this is a very important process to go through. And I just want to highlight that there are so many key questions and so many key steps and so many key considerations that we need to go through in order to get to a really viable, attractive opportunity uh, for hydrogen projects and, and its derivatives. So this is an example of where we got to that green flag. It says, yes, this is a promising opportunity. Let's take this forward. Um, but let's go to the next slide and, and look at a case where that, that may not necessarily uh, be the, be the end result. And so we might go through that whole process. Everything's looking very favorable. And then suddenly we get to... Um, a major barrier, a social or environmental barrier. It might be that the community doesn't want to develop the, the wind farm that's associated with this project to generate the electricity for the low carbon or low emission hydrogen. 
if you don't have that social acceptance, that is a major project barrier. Um, and so we really have to look at, you know, is there a way that we can address this? Can we work with the community, um, you know, help to inform and help to maximize the benefits of this project? Um, you know, or if it's an on the environmental side, how can we mitigate the environmental risks or potential impacts of that project? If those risks and impacts can't be mitigated, or if we don't have the social buy-in from the community, then that project may not go forward. And this is a really important consideration when we're looking at looking at these international opportunities for large scale hydrogen project development, where um, you, know, you might have a multinational company coming into your country, where, wherever it may be, in Africa, in Asia, South America, um, and the community is just not accepting that project. Uh, that project will not go forward and we seen that happen in time again uh, around the world. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to kind of illustrate some key considerations. Um, Sophie, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, some key considerations, uh, both environmentally and socially. So here are some key environmental considerations that also have social implications. For example, have we considered the carbon emissions and the life cycle assessment of the development um, for this hydrogen product or derivative, um, have we have we had third party verification to ensure that what we're stating in terms of carbon density or intensity for this product is is real and allows that to participate in international markets? Understanding as well that the global warming potential of hydrogen is greater than CO two, um, so do have we considered leakage? And if we haven't, that could be a serious contribution on the environmental side. So all of these things need to be monitored, they need to be verified uh, when we're looking at international markets. Have we looked at land availability for infrastructure? And again, is that actually available? Has the community accepted the use of that land for this particular purpose? Do we need resource extraction? Um, or are we gonna be resulting in land disruption that could also have social implications going forward? And again, do we have the community acceptance or community buy-in of that project considering those potential impacts? Um, Laurent mentioned water, and there were a lot of questions related to water. You know, what are the water requirements for the hydrogen production? Maybe around 10 liters per, per kilogram of hydrogen produced. Is that a problem for the community? Are we competing with other uses of that water? Is it a water limited or water scarce uh, area? In which case, that may be a major social issue that we'll have to deal with or find another location. So we really wanna look at what are the potential impacts on the ecosystem and the local communities by developing this project. Um, and, and we're going to be generating waste with these projects. So do we have a waste disposal plan in place? This is the same thing with any project, a mining project, renewable energy project, or other type of energy project. Um, these these are, are basic requirements, but ones that we need to make sure we're considering during the early development uh, phase of these projects. And especially if we're doing desalinization, how are we dealing with the brine that's going to be produced? How are we discharging that brine in a way that's not yielding environmental impacts and certainly social impact and the sustainability side you know are we using renewable energy resources where we can are we maximizing the, the utilization of those clean energy sources to again ensure the longer term sustainability of this project and and also ensure the low carbon or low emissions associated with it so we'll go into the next slide and just bringing this back into the social implications, which is very, very important for, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, very important for these projects. And this is what our next speaker is gonna be really focusing in on is that social acceptance of these projects is critical for project success. And so again, have we looked at land use and access considerations? Has the community allowed us to either lease or purchase the land for the development of that project? Um, if you don't have the access to that land via leasing or purchasing agreement, that would be a showstopper for a project. Um, how is our stakeholder engagement been from the beginning? Is there a positive or negative local perception of the project? Have we engaged them during that whole process to ensure that they're aware of all of the stages of project development from you know, early assessments, environmental assessments, to construction, to development, to operation, and even to decommissioning and closure of that project? Are they aware of all of those stages and, and what each of those stages would entail? Um, 
have we identified opportunities uh, for the local workforce development? So have we, you know, clearly communicated what the potential job opportunities are associated with that project? And what is the value chain and the supply chain in terms of positive impacts, but as well as risks? You know, do we have a big risk of importing electrolyzers or associated equipment for the development of this project? And, and could that be a showstopper down the road for the sustainability and continuity of the project? Um, again, coming back to water, this is a major social issue. So again, we don't want to ignore this. Um, are we competing with other uses via, it could be agriculture, it could be human consumption, other productive uses, for example, in the area. Um, but on the other side, do, could we have a positive benefit with this project? As Laurent mentioned, a lot of desalinization projects are for human consumption. And so via developing this project, could you then have a co-benefit of also supplying additional freshwater to the local community. Um, and then, you know, kind of looking at health and safety issues, Laurent mentioned some of the, the issues with transporting of ammonia um, and, and hydrogen as well. You know, there are very important safety issues that need to be considered and mitigated. Um, so again, you know, all of these things need to be incorporated in the project design from the beginning to ensure a successful project. And last but not least, is there an existing regulation in place for stakeholder engagement, uh, regulations in place to ensure environmental uh, compliance with whatever standards are being used, certification, third-party verification, all of this regulatory framework is very key for the success and development of any hydrogen market. So with that, I'm gonna pass it on to our next speaker, Catherine, who's gonna dive into some of these environmental and social considerations and experiences pulling from our experience in the US in the OSED demonstration projects. Over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Daniela. It's lovely to be here today. Uh, really appreciate you having me. Um, and yeah, as, as Danielle said, I'm the Community Benefits Negotiation Lead for the U.S.'s Department of Energy's Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, uh, or OSED, as we call it. If you're not familiar, our office was established uh, in December of 2021 to help scale the emerging technologies we need to tackle climate change and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. We're managing over 25 billion in funding to deliver those clean energy demonstration projects. And this includes our regional clean hydrogen hubs program, which I'm sure some folks have heard of before. Um, but if not, I can drop a link to it in the chat. Um, so that, that regional clean hydrogen hubs program is seven, includes seven billion to establish uh, seven uh, clean hydrogen hubs. And it's part of a larger $8 billion program funded through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and so really the purpose of this program is to have these hydrogen hubs form a foundation of a national clean hydrogen network that will contribute substantially to decarbonization of decarbonizing multiple sectors of the economy. As Laurent mentioned, you know, there's so many uses for hydrogen. Um, but especially industries like uh, steel and cement and heavy duty transportation. So today I'm really, uh, as Daniela mentioned, gonna focus on our experience sort of at the US federal level uh, related to the social considerations, uh, social and environmental considerations and impacts related to hydrogen. Um, and so I'll be sort of talking through some examples of, of the engagement we've done, feedback we've gotten, and sort of what the landscape looks like there. Um, so let me go, yep, next slide, thank you, perfect. Um, all right, uh, I'm just gonna try to multitask and drop some links at the same time. Uh, okay, perfect. So, so before we dive into like, you know, the future of hydrogen, I want to start with um, where we're at in the United States today with some air quality pieces. Obviously, as we talked about in the last session, um, hydrogen has the potential to really improve air quality in some places. And so that's uh, super exciting. Um, and when we're thinking about sort of the social and environmental impacts, it's really important that we understand 
the baseline, the history, sort of what's happened in the past, um, so that we can proactively address any prior concerns that a community might have. Um, and take that into account as we move forward. So one example I just wanted to highlight um, is uh, Particulate Matter 2.5. Um, and this was a recent study uh, done in, in March 2019 uh, across the United States. And this found that fine particulate matter or PM 2.5 um, is, is the largest environment, which is the largest environmental health risk factor in the United States. Um, it's disproportionately caused by the consumption of goods and services, mainly by the non-Hispanic white majority, but disproportionately inhaled by Black and Hispanic minorities. Um, and you can see the bullets at the bottom there, um, the percentages sort of of that discrepancy. So Latinx Americans are exposed to 63% more PM 2.5 than they produce, Black Americans 56% more, and white, Amer white non-Hispanic Americans 17% uh, less. And so, um, you know, we know, of course, that on average, uh, or like a, at a high level, we have these opportunities to improve air quality writ large. Um, but if, if we uh, are able to sort of target locations and improve the air quality in the, in the locations and for those communities and individuals that have, you know, worse air quality and have been dealing with that for a long time, that can have a really substantial impact. Um, and of course, in the same way, if there are hydrogen production consumption and transport pathways that might increase uh, certain pollutants, we want to really make sure we're not adding additional burden to those communities that already are facing these higher burdens. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So we, in addition to sort of, you know, the um, importance of providing these tangible benefits to communities, we also talked a little bit um, in, you know, Daniela's presentation, especially about um, project risk. And one of those project risks is, you know, whether a community wants to host a new development, a new infrastructure development, energy development project. Um, and so we've seen, you know, across many energy generation technologies from nuclear to renewables, and now with hydrogen, um, that when we don't do really a meaningful engagement, uh, communities might, uh, you know, oppose projects, and that can really substantially lead to project delays or cancellations. And when I say meaningful here, what I really mean is that it's, you know, early, frequent, two-way, so that we're not just telling people things, but actually incorporating feedback into the project, and that it has that that engagement has the ability to tangibly change what happens in the project. So maybe communities are engaged uh, before the site is selected and they're able to provide some input on where that project eventually ends up. So really tangible impacts. Um, and so I just put a few examples here of, of recent um, sort of case studies around or uh, uh, projects around hydrogen. So there's, you know, been some recent notes both in the US, but also in, you know, internationally around um, specific projects for hydrogen facing pushback from communities. Um, and, you know, this, this aligns with our understanding of that in other technologies as well. Um, so that this map that is showing is from uh, uh, Massachusetts in uh, Institute of Technology, MIT's Renewable Energy Clinic. And it looked at 50 renewable energy projects happening in the United States, um, about half of which were stopped or are paused due to public opposition. Um, and their research also shows that this opposition is not inevitable. So doing that early and meaningful engagement with impacted groups can minimize that acceptance risk and maximize the opportunities for communities and workers to experience the benefits of those projects. And when folks start seeing benefits of projects or seeing you know, uh, existing uh, burdens being uh, reduced, you know, that 
has a real positive uh, reinforcing mechanism on the acceptance of these projects. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So we talked a little bit about workforce too um, in, in both of the last uh, discussions. And of course, this is critical, right? Because we can't uh, build these projects without highly skilled and trained workers. Um, and we need to make sure that the jobs that are created are um, attractive and quality to, to those workers so that they want to stay. So just a, a little bit of background on the situation in the United States. Uh, our energy sector is adding jobs faster uh, than employers have been our uh, anticipating, um, and uh, it's outpaced our economy-wide employment growth. Um, many employers have reported difficulty in finding qualified workers, um, and four out of five report at least some difficulty. In, in the United States, uh, union employers generally report lower difficulty finding workers than non-union employers. Um, in terms of uh, hydrogen, if you can go to the next slide, please. In terms of hydrogen specifically, um, based on industry estimates, the hydrogen economy can create 100,000 net new direct and indirect jobs uh, related to the build out of new capital projects and new clean hydrogen infrastructure by 2030, which is quite soon in the US alone. Um, and to, of course, you know, to really attract and retain that number of people, these jobs have to be high paying with strong labor protections and training and placement opportunities such as register apprenticeships and pathways for that long-term career growth. Um, I, I want to highlight here, and again, this might be a resource that has already been distributed, so apologies if I'm uh, being redundant here, but um, our office collaborated with some others in the Department of Energy to uh, draft uh, pathways to lift off reports, and we have uh, one specifically for hydrogen, which I'll drop in the chat here, um, and then, oh, that link didn't work, sorry. I'll drop it in the chat in a minute. Um, uh, and then we also have one that's focused broadly on sort of the societal considerations and impacts um, for multiple technology pathways. So let me just uh, put those both in the chat here. Um, in terms of sort of that workforce development piece, um, you know, as is common in sort of new and innovative sectors, the jobs won't aren't going to map one to one from income incumbent industries, especially uh, in a like specific geography geographical location. Um, but in this case, skill set skill sets from fossil dependent industries like oil and gas are expected to have significant overlap with the hydrogen economy. Um, so we can really you know minimize worker displacement and maximize uh, that job transition opportunity to those uh, quality jobs. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to spend a, a lot of time here and really dig in on some examples. So Daniela provided an excellent overview of the types of sort of environmental and social um, aspects that are important to think through and understand when pursuing uh, really, you know, any energy development, but of course, specifically hydrogen. And one of the tricky things about hydrogen, um, as we've heard earlier today as well, is there are so many ways to produce, distribute, and use hydrogen, right? And so the types and the magnitudes of the impacts from hydrogen is going to vary dramatically by project, right? There is not like a one size fits all. Okay, we know if you do a, a hydrogen project, this is going to be the impacts. Um, and so of course, because of that, looking at the details um, and doing that really deep dive on that project specific analysis um, it is critical, of course. Um, and so, you know, that means that hydrogen where it's deployed, how it's deployed, what technology pathways are used, it can either really um, combat or improve sort of um, existing air quality and uh, things like that, uh, 
it, it can improve um, existing inequalities and in access to, to those resources, or it can exacerbate them. Um, it can exacerbate those inequalities in how benefits and burdens are distributed. So, you know, like, one hydrogen project in one location could improve air quality another in another in the same location but a different project could actually uh, make air quality worse so i'm gonna um, spend a little bit of time here talking through some of the key concerns uh, or potential benefits that we've heard through our engagement um, around hydrogen at the department of energy and these are gonna fit very nicely into, oh, sorry, can you stay on the previous slide? We're gonna be on this slide for, <laughs> for a few more minutes, sorry. Um, uh, and these are gonna fit really nicely into sort of the categories that Daniela mentioned. So the first, of course, is safety. Um, and, and this includes both the safety of the hydrogen infrastructure itself and the safety of CO2 infrastructure if that hydrogen is produced with carbon capture, transport, and storage. Um, and so, you know, thinking through sort of the value chain of hydrogen from the production side, um, in the United States, the hydrogen value chain is regulated by various fed federal entities. Um, and so on the production side, there, there's there been sort of concerns uh, depending on the approach. So reformation-based approaches using CCS, of course, can introduce concerns related to um, groundwater contamination, pipeline leakages or explosions, and the resulting health impacts, induced seismicity, uh, uh, continued fossil fuel dependence, methane emissions, and potentially high cost. Um, and so, of course, compliance with existing codes and standards and development of new best practices is really critical to help manage those risks. Um, on the midstream, so that transport piece, um, like all pipelines, of course, hydrogen pipelines, you know, are designed around codes and standards to ensure safety, um, but they all pose risks if not properly monitored and maintained and when there aren't adequate safety measures. Um, in the US, there's about um, 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipelines operational at the moment. Um, and of course, with hydrogen, due to the properties of the hydrogen molecule, it can be more challenging to manage than some other, um, other uh, materials. So we need to make sure there's really cautious and deliberate steps to uh, ensure that there's sufficient leakage detection that will flag hydrogen losses, even in really uh, small concentrations. And this is particularly challenging if we're sort of reusing or repurposing existing pipelines. Um, and of course, there is a difference as well between a dedicated pipeline for hydrogen and if hydrogen is blended with other materials like natural gas. Um, so those those are um, a few a few of the top line concerns we've heard. Um, related to that uh, sort of hydrogen blending with natural gas, we've heard a lot of concerns around the fact that there's not um, as robust sort of standards or, or understanding of those impacts. Um, so at present, as far as I'm aware, there's not an industry consensus about the blending limit for hydrogen and natural gas pipelines. Um, the California Public Utility Commission, for example, indicates that more than 5% could require um, a retrofit of appliances that take that blended fuel um, and has raised uh, questions about sort of the health impacts of burning uh, natural gas and hydrogen together. So NOx, for example. Um, other states like Hawaii have already blended hydrogen up to 15% in their grid. Um, and there's a DOE initiative called High Blend, which aims to address the challenges associated with blending hydrogen and natural gas pipelines, um, including those risks risks and costs associated with different blend con concentrations. So that's just sort of one example of sort of the, the safety um, concerns that we've heard related to high, different pathways for hydrogen production and transportation. 
Moving on to the second bullet, as I said, I lost. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, same slide. We're just on the second bullet. We're going to still be here for a minute. Um, so on the health impact side, right? Of course, we've been talking about air quality impacts of hydrogen can, can really provide benefits to communities that have faced significant uh, air pollution in the past. Um, but it's not guaranteed depending on the pathways. So uh, when electrolysis using clean, plow clean power replaces carbon intensive hydrogen or other um, energy sources, it can eliminate criteria air pollutants like SOx, particulate, NOx. Um, and those are of course linked to higher risks of lung cancer and respiratory illnesses. Um, so that's a real positive. Of course, for um, uh, other pathways, you know, we have to be much more careful about uh, those air impacts quality. So in the absence of emission control devices, SMR can re uh, result in um, emissions of things like VOCs, um, which can cause or increase respiratory il illness, asthma, and other, other factors. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's that, that piece uh, related to sort of the projection side. Um, on the end use side, again, if we think about hydrogen fuel cells, uh, there's the potential to significantly reduce air pollution uh, as the only byproducts are electricity, water, and heat. If we're combusting the hydrogen, that's a different scenario. So hydrogen combustion emits uh, nitrous oxide um, and uh, we, that's one of the um, real areas of focus, I think, for a lot of communities that are have raised concerns about um, hydrogen use is that um, potential for increased NOx emissions in the cases where hydrogen is combusted as an end use. Um, and so that requires advanced pollution control technology or, you know, lowering flame temperatures, um, which can result in uh, efficiency losses and power decreases. So I think that's a really active area of work is how to, to manage that NOx emission in cases for hydrogen combustion. Um, other, other areas of uh, uh, topics that we've heard a lot about from our engagement are, of course, that water piece, which we've talked about in uh, substantial detail already, so I won't dive into that quite as much. Um, but another, another key highlight really is around the carbon intensity of hydrogen. We've heard a lot of, of communities raise concerns around, is this hydrogen really going to help us solve, you know, is this hydrogen project really going to help us solve uh, the climate crisis by reducing life cycle greenhouse gas emissions compared to baseline? Or is this, is this really not going to help if we actually look at the full life cycle impacts? Um, so that's a key concern we've we've heard a lot. Um, like one example of of sort of the the details that we're um, you know thinking through and aware of and have been raised before are um, around the purity requirements for hydrogen if and especially if they're transported via pipeline. Um, so you know if there's a pipeline that does not have uh, the highest purity then that hydrogen is going to need to be filtered for applications that require high purity, like a fuel cell vehicle. Um, and if, you know, you use a process of like pressure swing absorption, that can result in significant losses. Um, and so those losses can contribute potentially to um, reduced efficiency overall and that like uh, increased in carbon intensity of the hydrogen. And so that's one small example, but the point is just people really want to know, and we've heard this in the other presentations too, to build that trust that this hydrogen, uh, you know, a new hydrogen project's really going to uh, tackle the climate problem. Um, people really want to understand the details and make sure that the carbon intensity is low and that there's not all these uh, sort of fugitive pathways happening that aren't captured. Um, in that carbon intensity. Cost is another concern that we hear. Um, so increased cost to an individual consumers, um, for example, um, will hydrogen improve the business case of clean power assets, renewable energies, for example, that spurs more near-term development of that power, um, or will it increase the demand for clean electricity in that in a way that leads to higher electricity prices for consumers. Um, 
so hopefully that provides a little more insight and some details into the concerns that were uh, or questions that we're hearing from community members related to uh, hydrogen development in their in their areas. Next slide, please. We finally made it through this slide. Thank you all for <laughs> for uh, continuing to listen. Okay, so given that context of sort of where we are um, in the United States uh, related to this hydrogen program. I wanted to talk a little bit about how our office is ensuring that our projects include um, community and labor, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, um, quality jobs and workforce development, and energy and environmental justice, or the Justice 40 initiative, in all of our projects. Um, so in, in OSED, my office in the Department of Energy, we require all applications to include what we call a community benefits plan. Um, and that's really the goal of which is to ensure that broadly shared prosperity in the clean energy transition. Um, and so the community benefits plan has these four pillars that I mentioned. Um, the first community and labor engagement. The point of that is really to ensure that the people that are impacted by energy development have a role in the decisions that affect their life. So that's what I was sort of talking about on that. What is meaningful engagement? Um, that there's there's a role in those decisions. For diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, this is about supporting equitable access to wealth building opportunities for all, especially those that have faced systemic barriers to quality employment and training. Investing in the American workforce is to build the skilled long-term workforce needed to power our energy transition and ensure that quality jobs are open to all. And the Justice 40 initiative um, is to ensure that project benefits um, flow to disadvantaged communities and that we're really working to maximize those benefits and minimize any harms or negative impacts. Next slide, please. Okay, so these community benefits plans or CBPs, how, do, how does this work in our actual um, projects that we've run in our office? So in OSED, um, we have a phased approach for our projects. And this is really, you know, uh, created by incorporating well-established principles um, to minimize risk and help projects step through the phases that are required for success from that conceptual design during the application stage through construction and operations. And between each stage, um, there are what, what we call sort of uh, go no go um, or decision points, uh, which you can see are those little uh, white diamonds there. Um, and those are sort of a check on, you know, has the progress during that stage, during that phase um, met what was expected, um, and can the project move on to the subsequent phase and get additional funding. So for the community benefits plan itself, uh, this, uh, the work and the um, sort of content is required at each phase of the project throughout the whole project life cycle. So starting an application. Uh, as I mentioned, all, all projects are required to submit a community benefits plan in the application. These are evaluated by experts in the, you know, four topic areas, quality jobs and workforce development, DEIA, engagement, um, and environmental and energy justice. And they're typically scored at 20% of the overall score um, for each application. And so that means that how program or how applicants um, do on their community benefits plan has a really tangible impact on what projects are actually selected to be funded. Um, so that 20% is on par with sort of the other uh, areas that we judge projects on, including technical, financial, project management, et cetera. So this has a, so, so the community benefits portion has a really bottom line, a uh, tangible impact on what projects we actually choose to fund. Once we select projects to, 
uh, to move forward, they enter a negotiation process. And so this is still before any funds have been distributed. Um, and during that process, we work with the selectees to improve their community benefits um, before we enter into award. So any um, weaknesses that were found during that application process must be addressed during the negotiation. If projects make it through the negotiation phase, which is not guaranteed, um, and they successfully uh, enter into award, that is when we actually uh, just start distributing money and we enter our four phased approach. Um, so the first be, being that detailed planning, the next being project development, a lot of permitting happens in phase two. Phase three is the main construction phase and phase four is operation. And you can see some um, sort of example timelines of what the how long each of those phases could be for these large projects. For the community benefits specifically, um, at the beginning of each, we sort of like repeat the process each phase. So at the beginning uh, of the phase before we distribute that money, we negotiate what work and commitments are related to engagement, quality jobs, workforce development, DEIA, Justice 40, is gonna happen during that phase. Then in each phase, those activities are implemented um, and the projects, you know, iterate and improve on their plans for the next phase. How well the projects, you know, do this work during that phase is then evaluated at the go-no-go no go decisions and can contribute to the decision of whether projects are able to move forward into the next phase and receive additional funding. Um, and then if so, uh, the process repeats. So if they, you know, make it to the next phase, then new community uh, benefit commitments and activities are negotiated, carried out, evaluated, etc. Um, and in our office, we make the community benefit commitment summaries public on our website at the um, start of each phase. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Um, of course, the details of what, you know, community benefits activities or requirements make sense are going to vary widely by project, by location, who the, you know, uh, stakeholders, constituents are that have interest in the project, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, again, this is very, the intent here is very much like not a one size fits all approach. But of course, there are some elements that make really strong community benefits. Um, and that's uh, that they have that tangible impact and tangible outcomes, right? That it's not just like a check in the box. Um, so we've put some examples here of, of elements we think make really strong community benefits uh, plans. And one of them is moving, you know, beyond a high level vision or assessment, like beyond sort of a boilerplate, we, we would love to um, provide, you know, help to the community to really actionable goals, outcomes and implementation steps that are supported by the money, people and time resources needed to carry that out. They should include mechanisms for accountability to and transparency with the impacted and community communities and workers. So we don't want projects just to tell us at the Department of Energy what they're doing. We want them to communicate with the people and workers that are actually impacted. You want clear metrics to measure success. Um, and we would like to see that the actions that are proposed during the project are in alignment with the needs and priorities of impacted communities. And of course, that requires uh, deep engagement to understand what those needs and priorities are. They should robustly address the sort of holistically the four topic areas that I mentioned. So not just picking out, we're only going to focus on, um, you know, DEIA but they have to do all, all four of those topic areas. Um, and really proactively minimizing and mitigating any negative impacts and harm, especially for those communities that are already have already ha are facing those burdens. For example, like the one we looked at with air quality earlier. That quality jobs should be created and that there should be ex equitable access um, for those facing barriers. And that we really need to provide those pathways through robust workforce development. 
We also expect that uh, those community benefits, plans and commitments are should evolve over time. Um, if we, you know, knew everything from the beginning, then uh, that would sort of negate the necessity for engagement. But we don't know everything from the beginning, which is the whole point. Um, and so as things are learned, as engagement happens, as analysis is done, as the project progresses, we expect that the details of uh, the community benefits plan and the project itself should evolve based on that feedback. And then finally, um, one of the things that um, DOE has been uh, sort of pro promoting is working towards enforceable agreements between the actual project performers and, and the communities and workers. Um, so of course, you know, from DOE's perspective, if we fund a project, we have that relationship with the project. But we want there to be accountability between not just us and the project, as I mentioned before, but the actual impacted communities um, and the project. And so um, there's uh, several ways this can happen, but there are some common um, types of legally binding negotiated agreements uh, that can sort of codify that relationship. Those could be, um, you know, project labor agreements or other collective bargaining bargaining agreements, those could be things like community benefits agreements or good neighbor agreements, as some examples. Um, and if you want more information about how we're, we're thinking about this, um, for all of OSED's funding opportunities, we've developed some guidance documents um, for the community benefits plan. Um, I can drop a link in for the one for the hydrogen hubs into the chat. Um, uh, and we have specific uh, I hope that works. Um, we have specific ones for each of our um, different funding opportunities. Uh, so with that, um, I will um, open it up if there's any questions. I'm sorry, I have not been paying attention to the chat. I am bad at multitasking, um, no but happy to, to take any questions. And thanks so much for your attention. Thanks so much, Catherine. Uh, really great experience pulling from all of these OSAID projects. Um, there's one particular question on why is the focus on residential communities? Is not an industrial thrust quicker, faster, and cheaper to prove projects? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It cut out yeah. a little bit for me. Oh, I can see it. Is it not in- You can is, see it. it's, it's the second question in the Q&A. Got it. Yes. So I think the question here, and please jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, is really about what the um, uh, application or sort of uh, sector is for decarbonization. Um, and uh, is that, am I, is that correct? Like, wh why did I talk yeah, about Robbie, is that maybe... not just like an industrial facility? I, I think so as well. But maybe Ravi, if you want to clarify that question and provide a bit more context, that would be great. Okay, no worries can, if not. <laughs> I can talk to you a little bit on it um, sure. for sure. If 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 I'm interpreting the question uh, correctly, um, of course, yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Robbie. You're, yeah, um, you're yes, of course, there are you know pathways that are um, hard, harder to to decarbonize sectors like heavy industry, heavy transport, things like that um, are certainly a focus. And in the um, you know. Uh, pathways report that I linked, it sort of outlines that. And of course, the decarbonization strategies of many, many different entities and countries highlight that as well. Um, I would say in terms of the like, sort of environmental and social aspects of that, um, oftentimes, though, you know, uh, industrial facility um, is in a place where, where there are you know fence line communities living next to it or like we'll still have those environmental impacts right so um my my intent with my presentation and i'm sorry if i was not clear on that was not to only focus on like residential applications um although i did you know mention that some folks are concerned for example about if you blend uh hydrogen and natural gas and then you use that um in your 
residential uh, appliances. Um, that I would, my intent was not to to only focus on those applications, but rather to say that in any application there will be environmental impacts and social impacts, um, whether that's a residential or uh, you know industrial application, and that those should be considered. Um, I hope that helps. Happy to elaborate more if that wasn't really the the right um, interpretation. Right. Thank you. Um, so I'm just checking the chat. So I think there were a few other questions that came up and I'll try and integrate them into our closing panel. Um, but Catherine, just in general, obviously, you know, over $25 billion of projects in OSED, there's a lot that can be learned. Um, what do you think other countries can learn from the OSED approach, specifically related to promoting or supporting the development of hydrogen markets in other countries? Yes. Uh, this, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think one of, so like, and I, I'm not an expert in hydrogen markets, I will say. Um, but, but I think broadly, like, uh, if we look just at that, I think the, the production side and the demand side are both really critical. Um, and we've seen, you know, that having that balance is, is, uh, challenging and and something people are, are working on a lot um, in, in terms of sort of the overall approach of how to make sure the like environmental and social aspects are considered throughout uh, I I think like having having those tangibly impact what projects move forward and how they evolve over time uh, is really critical um, and so like having some sort of uh, consistent structure or plan about how those are incorporated right from the very beginning so that you don't get like many years into the plan and then you're like, oh, shoot, <laughs> you know, we realized we haven't had a consistent um, or robust way to include those that can, um, you know, make it really challenging to get back that trust and like start once you're already, you know, in having done a lot of work in the project. So that's, I think, at a high level, what I would say, um, if that, happy to elaborate more if, if that's helpful. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really good. And also, I guess, just kind of, um, you know, on the question of sort of public subsidies or or the role of procurements and supporting the start or initiation of hydrogen markets, um, you know, it, do you think it's important to have kind of government intervention in kicking off some of these uh, these transition or, or sort of state of the art technologies such as hydrogen or its derivatives? Um, and obviously welcome Laurent as well to, to respond to that question. I'll let Laurent start if if he wants to. Also, can you see me still? My video just no, uh, <laughs> oh, disappeared. No. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to work on that in the meantime. <laughs> yes, I think you're right, Daniela. We also need to consider, I would say, uh, subsidies or grants uh, or public procurements in order to kickstart, I would say, uh, June economy. So, of course, the idea is to be uh, sustainable quite quickly, but uh, as I would say, any te new technology, any new energy. Uh, we need to have some public subsidies at the beginning because it mm -hmm. we know that everything which is new is the same for iPhones or for smartphones mm -hmm. some years ago uh, for video recorders at the beginning it's much more expensive than classical mm -hmm. usual means so that's why if we do not support these new technologies at the beginning by public subsidies it won't happen and in particular mm -hmm. I think now we have no more time to wait and just to let the market do so we need to put that in place but of course it has to be compliant with WTO rules too. Mm -hmm. So now we can also see how use WTO rules in order to make it happen quicker. So mm -hmm. this is something IPHE is now working on with WTO to see uh, what are the different subsidies, uh, public policies, uh, what the tax tariffs put in place, uh, just to to facilitate the, this kind of uh, new of new ex international exchanges. Right. So that's why, yes, and I think in your decision tree, you may mm -hmm. also then introduce these uh, subsidies. Uh, mm -hmm. And for instance, you have uh, IRA in Europe, the VCU Hydrogen Bank or H2 Global, uh, mm -hmm. which is really here. Then you have different CFD or CCFD or double auction systems, so which is different, different from one country to the other. So, uh, but it has to be considered and for sure it, it is needed, but not only for hydrogen production, also for transport, for mobility mm -hmm. uh, or in industry. But mm -hmm. of course, have, keeping in mind that it needs to have some to benefit 
also uh, not only to the economy but also to environment so uh, and that's why it's so important not only for instance to subsidize only renewable uh, hydrogen but any low emission hydrogen because uh -huh. uh, as we mentioned decarbonization is the key word so decarbonization means carbon footprint and carbon footprint means regardless is colorblind and regardless i would say the primary energy use and the technology and also uh -huh. regardless the technology use. so that's why it's yes we i think we should, we, we need to have it at the beginning yeah Agree. Thank you. Um, one question in terms of we we've spoken a lot about you know low carbon hydrogen coming from renewable powered electrolysis. Uh, we haven't heard much uh, on geological hydrogen, which is a hot topic coming out right now. I'm curious if you have any comments on that and kind of where you're seeing um, development of of geological hydrogen in in the future and contributing to international markets. Uh Yes, thank you for the question. Geological hydrogen, yes, it becomes a hot topic, but uh, I think it's quite early. It's quite early to answer mm -hmm. the question. Is it uh, really a huge amount of hydrogen available? Uh, yes, but even if it is yes, at what cost? Uh, at what purity? And what uh -huh. and then implication, as mentioned by Catherine previously, that you have to purify also your hydrogen before delivering it. Uh, so there are still many, many questions to be answered. And this means that, yes, of course, we need to consider it. Uh, yes, we need then to engage and invest in research, uh, in, in small demonstration, to really have the real numbers, the real figures regarding quality, mm -hmm. quantity, flow, uh, and cost. Uh, because as mentioned, is it, is it a storage or it is a flow with a, with the, and then what is the production rate? Uh, will you deplete mm -hmm. your production rate or not? There are many questions. Uh, but yeah. this just to say that, yes, it can be huge, but in any mm -hmm. case, we do not have to slow down any other ways to produce hydrogen. Mm -hmm. so I think this is just, this may be an additional, and if it works, we will have the answer between in the next five to 10 years, not before. So right. absolutely no reason <laughs> to slow down any uh, other investments in particular producing hydrogen by electrolysis. Uh, because sometimes, depending on the country, some no politicians or industrials are telling, "Wow, that's the silver bullet. We have more hydrogen that uh, we need, and so let's just stop the rest because we will just have to to drill the earth, and it's coming." No, <laughs> let's have a look and uh, do not slow down. So yes, to be considered, but with cautious and not to slow down any other investments. That's great. Thank you. Um, and you did touch on the topic of long-term storage and associated costs, which is another one of the questions that we have in the Q&A. Um, we did address this in some of our previous webinars, so I invite everybody to also revisit some of the previous webinars, such as webinar three on technical considerations, um, but not sure if, if Laurent, if you have anything uh, that you wanted to mention on the topic of uh, hydrogen and long-term storage and, and associated costs at this stage. Yes, no, that's a very good point. Yes, so we speak all of speak about hydrogen production, hydrogen consumption, but in particular, if you want to use hydrogen for industrial uh, applications, usually it's a twenty four hours day, twenty four hours a day, and uh, thirty uh, three hundred sixty five days a year that we need to provide and to to provide this hydrogen to industry. So for sure, in particular, if you are using renewable hydrogen, uh, you need to have some storage. And that's why also when I was presenting at the beginning, what are the key drivers? Uh, I was also mentioning this uh, grid stability resilience. And this was also part, part of the story is depending on the storage capacity. So uh, what are the existing pipes? Uh, what are the existing electrical grids? If you want to produce continuously hydrogen or distribute continuously hydrogen for the, the amount of industry is needing, uh, you need to have this uh, infrastructure in place. And you, in any case, you will need to have some storage but then you have to size the storage and the, the size mm -hmm. of the storage will really depend on the location where you are either producing or consuming and right. the capacity of your grid mm -hmm. so that's why uh, and here also we still have some uh, open questions and that's also mm -hmm. uh, as you are at NREL some some topics for research uh, what about cyclability but if mm -hmm. we want to it, who say storage this filling emptying filling emptying what about this uh, cyclability uh, of hydrogen reservoirs underground uh, in terms of efficiency, safety? So here also there are some uh, ongoing uh, research demonstration uh, in order to see how it works and if it works well, depending also on the, on the I would say the, 
geological solution use if it is uh, different canons, what kind of canons and how it works. So yes, it's mm -hmm. it's an important topic, and I thank you for the question because I think and for this Q and A, this is something usually we are uh, a little uh, forgetting <laughs> to see that this is also something to be considered uh, quite seriously. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And I think one other thing to to consider quite seriously, and and this is something we touched on, but the topic of uh, hydrogen's potential implications on global warming potential, for example, um, if if maybe we can speak a little bit more on that, and you know what is hydrogen's impact on climate change? We know that hydrogen in and of itself is not a greenhouse gas, however, um, can have impacts on global warming with with leakage. Um, so maybe if you can speak a bit on on that before we start our closing session. Yes, that's uh, exactly, and that's what you mentioned also uh, in your slides, you know, the cesium tree and Katrina. So uh, I think this has to be really taken very seriously. And as you mentioned, what one thing is sure, hydrogen is not a greenhouse gas. So hydrogen has a global warming potential, but as tens of molecules. If you look the IP IPCC documents, and IPCC tables, you will see there are maybe 50 or more than 50 molecules having assigned a global warming potential. But none of these are included in the equation for the quantification of the CO2 equivalent. So why hydrogen? Mm -hmm. So I know that some are pushing to introduce hydrogen into the CO2 equivalent uh, quantification. Okay, but then we have to include all the other tens of molecules too. Why only hydrogen? So mm -hmm. this is for me uh, well, either everyone or nobody, not only mm -hmm. hydrogen. And then one question we have to answer is uh, yes, hydrogen has an impact, uh, but by increasing the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere. So the problem is not hydrogen in the atmosphere. The problem is why, why do we have methane in the atmosphere? So maybe the it's bigger problem is to, to, <laughs> is to decrease the amount of methane in the atmosphere. And that's why uh, we also have to answer the question about the hydrogen budget. Where is the hydrogen in the atmosphere coming from? And when you look at the different papers from different climate experts, the main hydrogen emitters are the combustion of fossil fuels and biomass. Yeah. It's not the hydrogen industry. So that's why we also have to be very careful and not to put all the I would say, uh, tell the hydrogen economy and hydrogen industry with the leakages will be bad for the climate and even will be detrimental and not beneficial. Of course, we do not have to uh, hide it. We need to work on this uh, hydrogen emission, hydrogen leakages to make it as low as possible all along the value chain, uh, but not only for climate change impact, but also regarding safety issues. And this has been mentioned uh, and also regarding cost. It's quite expensive to produce hydrogen, to do you think industry agrees to lose uh, three, five, ten percent of hydrogen produced? Uh, no, they want to make money, which means they also want to reduce the leakages. But for the rest, of course, today maybe we may have uh, three to five percent of leakages. But even three to five percent of leakages uh, regarding one hundred million tons of hydrogen produced every year means around three to five million tons lost in the atmosphere. But the current hydrogen budget from the climate experts just tells us that today there are between 16 and 18 million tons of hydrogen in the atmosphere every year. So you see, we may increase it by 3 to 5 over 80. So of course, we need to reduce it as much as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. But we cannot say that it will, be, it will have a detrimental uh, negative impact uh, on the climate change. In addition, we also have to keep in mind that displacing fossil hydrogen by using low emission hydrogen will then mean that we will use less fossil fuels. And this will be beneficial yeah. globally. And also by using hydrogen instead of fossil fuels for other industrial uh, applications like steel, for instance, steel making, we also mm -hmm. just induce that we will use less fossil fuels. And then even if we have some leakages, uh, even if we are using low emission hydrogen coming from uh, fossil fuels with CCS, globally, mm -hmm we will decrease the CO2 emission into the atmosphere and also the methane emissions if we move for, uh, if we uh, get rid of using uh, natural gas. So you see, but mm -hmm. as mentioned, this has to be quantified and that's why the mm -hmm. uh, hydrogen community has to work with uh, the uh, climate experts and with IPCC uh, experts to, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, discuss together to see uh, what are the real impacts, what are the real reactions in the atmosphere with hydrogen and then 
-hmm. Also, uh, the hydrogen industry may also support to, to develop some sensors, sensors to quantify, I would say, the hydrogen uh, in the atmosphere, but sensors mm -hmm. to measure any leakages which may arise right. along the supply chain. Uh, that's for mm -hmm. sure. And then to have really real numbers, real figures, understanding the mechanisms of emission, but also the mechanism yeah. of sink of hydrogen. Because uh, I mm -hmm. think what is important is the balance. But the problem mm -hmm. is we do not have really strong models uh, because we are most lacking of data on what are the real mm -hmm. sinks of hydrogen. Maybe it's ground, yeah. the earth, but depending it's a forest, if it's sand, if it's humid or not, mm -hmm. if it's rocks, it's totally different. But we, we, we yeah. need these kind of numbers. So that's why I, I personally, I never use hydrogen as an indirect greenhouse gas because it is not. And if you say indirect, people are forgetting indirect. They're just uh, having mm -hmm. in mind greenhouse gas. So that's mm -hmm. why, mm -hmm. yes, it may have an impact, but by increasing mainly uh, methane um, lifetime in the atmosphere, it may also mm -hmm. have some direct greenhouse gas impact by producing water vapor, but in this troposphere, not in this stratosphere, so very high mm -hmm. altitudes. Mm -hmm. And the lifetime to move from one layer to the other layer is around the lifetime of the hydrogen in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. one, two years. Mm -hmm. So you see, so it's not, as, if you are not producing that hydrogen in that uh, troposphere, it may not have a real impact on the greenhouse gas. As mm -hmm. just an example, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. But as mm -hmm. we say that it, this is not connected to, uh, it's not anthropogenic uh, right. water vapor, so it is not included in the equation, but it, it is a greenhouse gas. So just to see, this is really a, a important topic, not to hide anything, to be as transparent as possible, but to be also very objective, providing numbers, arguments, mm -hmm. and of course, to see how at government level, at private level, how we can all work together in order really to, to put in place right measures in order to decrease as much as possible any leakages and to optimize the beneficial impact on the, on, on the climate by using low emission mm -hmm. hydrogen. That was great. And it, obviously a very comprehensive response. And I think we could probably spend a whole webinar just on this topic. Um, thanks so much for that. I know we're, we're almost at time. Um, I know that there's a lot of interest from the participants in seeing how they can get involved, how they can contribute, what other resources are available. So I guess for both of our panelists, um, you know, for Laurent, uh, what are some of IPHE's activities, um, skills mapping, the DIEA plan? platform launched by IPHE, uh, the Hydrogen Council, what are some ways that, that folks can get involved? And then I guess for Catherine as well, are there any upcoming OSED programs or DOE programs related to hydrogen that the audience should be aware of? We could start yes, with Laurent. Thank you. So regarding uh, IPHE, so IPHE has mentioned the government to government partnership, and we try really to exchange at governmental level. And uh, um, among, I would say, the different task forces, uh, there is one on, uh, of course, carbon footprint, certification schemes already covered, but there are some others regarding trade rules. That's why we're also working with WTO to see how, by working together, we can also increase and speed up the international trade of hydrogen. Another one is on, uh, uh, yes, um, skills. And uh, DIA platform, but it has been mentioned by uh, by like Catherine, uh, also to include minorities, uh, to adjust transition. This is also very important, just transition. That's why when we have some international exchanges, you need to ensure that if you are importing hydrogen, it is not detrimental for the country and the people where you produce that hydrogen. So it has really to be a just transition. And this is also something we try to, uh, to work on and regarding skills. We also are now mapping uh, what are the different uh, jobs uh, in hydrogen uh, regarding what has been produced as mentioned by DOE, but many other countries. And then the idea is to share with anyone interested in some, I would say, some uh, some summary, uh, some assessment. If you want to start your hydrogen economy, what are the skills you need? What are the jobs, the level of expertise you need for these jobs? Uh, uh, not, I would say, to, to do it again, uh, but to use this, I would say, yes, uh, Common, what are the best practices uh, from the different uh, country, IPHC countries? And uh, mm -hmm. for the year, yes, already mentioned, to have some mentors, mentees, to really uh, be sure this is just on this, including uh, minorities, women in hydrogen. Uh, so this is also quite important. And uh, I, th I think that's more or less. And to be involved, I think 
Also, if you are either if you are part of a government, of course, you may join IPHG Secretariat to see how to be involved in IP as an IPHG member. If you are part of an initiative, uh, then here I'll say a good um, place is also to into to to enter into contact with the Brexit agenda. As uh, under the Brexit agenda, we are trying to coordinate and any organization, public organization interested in uh, wanting to be involved in halogen, just contact mm -hmm. also the Brexit agenda or IPHE, and then we can also integrate your own activities into this uh, common sharing of priorities and uh, and outcomes. So you see, yes, okay. open for collaboration mm -hmm. at, uh, at different levels. Great, thank you very much. And I don't know if Catherine, we still can't see you, but if you had anything to add to that. <laughs> I'm here, I'm sorry, I don't know, it's so strange. Um, yeah, just a, a few things I put in the chat, I'll just, I know we're up on time. We do, um, we are working on a demand side initiative, which I mentioned. Um, so we had a, a recent notice of intent that's gonna be um, developing over this calendar year. So stay tuned if you want more information, um, it'll be up on our website. And then um, I just, this is more for local audiences. So um, I don't know how relevant for folks on the line, but if you wanted to see examples of some of the sort of higher level engagement activities we're doing for these big hydrogen hubs, I just put the link to our engagement opportunities. So Great. thanks. Thanks so much. And I think Sophie, if you wanted to go ahead and pull up our last slide, um, and in case there's any other comments uh, from our panelists or our participants, we do have one more minute. Um, otherwise, please feel free to, to reach out to us via email. Um, we'd be happy to respond to any questions. We'll obviously be sharing the recording as well as the presentation from this webinar. Um, and if you missed any of the other webinars, please feel free to reach out to us. and We'd be happy to share those. They're also published on the Clean Energy Solutions Center website. Um, we have two more webinars coming up. Uh, the next one's going to be focused on hydrogen in the transport sector and infrastructure planning. So um, as this webinar series is focused both on presentations as well as tools that are available, open source tools developed by the national labs, uh, we will be diving into the SARA tool, which can specifically be used for hydrogen transport and infrastructure planning. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for that webinar. And then we have one last webinar, our seventh webinar of the series, which will focus on integrating everything together and looking at different applied uh, examples and case studies for hydrogen using the H2FAST tool. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks so much Laurent and Catherine for your amazing presentations and sharing your experiences with us today. And we look forward to seeing everyone in our next webinar. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks all. Bye.